Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 5th, 2021, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I'm sorry about the link getting messed up. If you registered more than a week ago, you unfortunately get to re-register and go to webinar. I was not able to transfer over the people. This is kind of a frustrating glitch when you end the show or when the series of a show ends, you lose all your registrants. And they sent me a very cumbersome workaround and it's just not worth it. So what are we going to talk about? Well, not that it's not worth it, it's just a, wasn't a, a plausible solution. Well, obviously we talk about current market conditions and it's kind of day by day. And today is one of those good days where it's like, you know, it looks like it's pretty good, but let's see what tomorrow brings. And I'll flesh that out in a little while. Your questions are on trading. I think I could probably handle random questions throughout the webinar tonight. I'll give it a shot. Usually I say, wait till we get to the live chart system, ADD doesn't kick in. Do hold off on your stock picks if you don't mind until we get to the live charts. That That'll make it easier for me to see the conversations and the questions being asked. So what we talk about, well, lately I've been talking about this doing trading stuff thing, and it really has me cognizant of, of how many things I do, the research that I'm doing, and the mistakes that I'm making, the, the questions that I still have, the questions that I create. And I've been doing a series with the stock market show, with a stock chart show, and uh, in that series, I talked about thinking like a trader. And I think it's probably more important for me to tell you how I think about these things as I, as opposed and in, in how to think about these things, as opposed to just showing you, hey, here's a pattern, go out and trade it. And that'll hopefully make a little sense as I go through some of these, these examples tonight. The other thing is figure this out and you'll own the world and it's one of those things that we probably don't focus enough on but it took me many many years to realize how important it is and we'll get to that in just one second there's flame screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often summing up barring a line from my friend greg morris all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then speaking of stuff i've been talking about this trading stuff we've been doing lately no need to explain this slide, but as I said a second ago, I've been really cognizant of what I've been doing. And every morning I, I wake up and write morning pages. And this morning alone, I wrote two pages on just stuff I wanted to talk about tonight and been working on my slides all day and I still haven't gotten to a third of this. So it's it's kind of exciting in a way. I'll just, we'll just have some uh, fodder for next week. But anyway, the mindset I've been in lately, just thinking a lot about trading. There hasn't been a whole lot going on on the position trading standpoint, except for the IPOs, we'll talk about that too. But there's been a lot of things I've been working on on an intraday basis, and of course, and as I said, the IPOs too. And then there's still a lot of work. In fact, it's a lot more work when there isn't setups. One of the things that's, that's a little counterintuitive is, when conditions are poor, I have to spend hours and hours going through my charts. When conditions are real good, I'd say within the first five to 10 minutes of flipping through the charts super fast, I can find some setups and good setups. And I and I could I could all but guarantee every good setup that you see in the portfolio now, especially the ones that have been in there for over a year, probably came within the first five minutes of my analysis that the rest of it was just dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and making sure there was nothing else out there. But usually, if I only had five minutes to do my analysis, I bet I could get, provided I had everything set up, set up takes a little while, I bet I could find setups and I might actually do better. Now, one of you guys who happens to be in here tonight has done extensive research in pretty much everything. And I know that years ago, I know you were working for someone doing research and that was 20 years ago. So I, I would imagine over 20 years, you probably learned a lot in the process. And you had emailed me about a week or two ago and said that you were taking a break from the buy and B pattern. And some of the members in Facebook continue to trade it, as do I. And I, I think if you if you believe in something, I think you have to keep doing it 
maybe get a little bit more selective, but be careful you don't completely eliminate what you're doing because the, the outlier effect can can really begin to kick in. And all you really need is one of these things to take off every now and, get, now and then to make it all worthwhile. So just kind of a random thought as I was putting these slides together, I meant to, I, I put this in last minute, IPO is not dead yet. And I'm gonna talk about a few of them tonight. Now, one thing I've been really cognizant of since I started this Thinking Like a Trader trader series, and also this been doing trading stuff all day, it's like I've just been slammed lately, not with the position, handling positions, and even handling positions doesn't take long. I mean, we've been, you know, you put the stop in and you go about your life on some of these, and in a lot of cases, I just put alert in and forget about it, especially these ones that have been up for or on for over a year. But anyway, the other thing I've been really busy with, and some of the, some of which I'll share with you tonight, a lot of which I've shared with you in prior webinars, is working on this this intraday trading. And lately, I've been really super cognizant of of my mistakes, and some of that will come out tonight. And I'll I've been working to admit more and more. I find the more that I admit mistakes, the better I get, as opposed to kind of sweeping them under the rug. And there are some issues with IPOs, and a lot of these are kind of newer issues. I don't remember when I did all the research for a couple of years, and then I finally did a course in 2014. I don't remember as many issues as there is now. And some of these issues aren't necessarily bad things and I want to get your thoughts on some of these too. And that's a great thing about interacting with each other in the Facebook group is we kind of see things from different angles and we can we learn a lot from each other. And and as I often say, I'm not the grand poobar or anything. I've just been doing this for a little while. I want to talk about this recent IPO trade. And it was a little kind of it was a little squirrely, I have to admit. Day five is right here. And remember for the buy at B, we're looking to buy a new closing high. And on this particular day, I anticipated it. And I did take this across multiple accounts, but I just wanna show you out of what I call the model account where I pull a lot of trades for these webinars. And the IPT was up here at 529. I got it at 429 and I have the trade somewhere I'll show you. And it just couldn't quite get to that 529 earlier today. And you could see when I took this snapshot, it actually has a print at 529, but my limit order did not get filled there. And it's like, you know what? I better not look a gift horse in the mouth. And I went ahead and took those profits right around there. Now there's the trades down there. You could see I don't have the price where I got in, but if you look, you can see I bought at the market about six minutes before the close. And I was anticipating based on the, the strength. And by the way, that's one thing that, let me just throw out a little trick here possibly. And I know it's worked really well in the past. Um, I really hadn't tracked it as much lately, but I found that sometimes you get in these IPOs when they're in the midst, midst of a wide range day, and it looks like they're going to trigger a buy at B. They could be worth getting in a little bit early, sometimes 30 minutes early or at least five or 10 minutes early as opposed to waiting for that close. Unfortunately, obviously, you don't have the confirmation of a true buy at B signal until after the close. And I'll show you one here in a minute that actually got in in after hours. Every now and then you could do that. But sometimes they get really thin in after hours because a lot of times they're really thin to begin with. But you can see I had the limit order in at 529, even though it hit 529, I did not get filled. And I said, you know what? This is one of those things where, I think it was William O'Neill or somebody, and he might've been telling somebody else's story, but it's like the guy had a turkey trap and a turkey walks in and he gets excited. Then another turkey walks in and he gets really excited, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. And at one time he had whatever, a dozen turkeys in there. And, and one walked out and then he had 11 and he's like, oh, I'm gonna wait till that one walks back in. And then another one walked out, then he had 10. And the story goes, I don't know if you call it a fable or, or whatever, allegory or whatever, 
but he ended up with no turkeys. You know, <laughs> that's why we take partial profits on positions. But anyway, it, it's a good story, and it reminds me of. I didn't think about it today, but I was thinking about. I can't sit here and watch this thing go from near 529 to 520 to 519 to 512 to 5 it changed to 495 and, and so on and so forth so finally i took the profits so it was 521 is where i ended up getting out eight cents below my ipt so what okay so i made a little bit less on the trade but a thousand shares better than poking the eye 920 dollars plus I'm now free rolling. If it comes back in, stops me out. So what? I know. Uh, so so what? But I'm gonna try. Try be the key word in that sentence. Not to not look at my equity, and now I got a free position. So by now you're probably thinking, I'm sure I'm impressed with this Dave guy with this buy a B pattern. Well, while I was working on my slides tonight, I went to StockCharts.com and I noticed that. Hang on, this stock does not look like an IPO. So I was kind of like, what the heck? I did a quick Google and the first thing came up was it's a Canadian cryptocurrency mining form. I knew that because I did I did want to know what they did. And by the way, not, not that you want to confuse the issue with facts too much, but I do like in general IPOs to be somewhat in an exciting business. Like if you take a look at uh, Academy, when it came public, I waited for a second entry type of setup on that. But in this case, it was a buy it be a little squirrely, I admit, usually don't go after something that crazy as an IPO. But the cryptos were making a big comeback. And that's something that I just didn't get around to, to getting into this week, maybe next week, unless I use the word hope, but hopefully they're still doing well next week, but I'll go in and we'll talk about that. But anyway, apparently this is a Canadian company and it's now trading on the NYSE. So that's one of the, the issues that I've ran into lately is that you see things as a new issue, but they're actually been around for a while. So I would encourage you to check multiple sources. Now, sometimes what happens is I try to start my IPO analysis at 2.30 and by the time I'm dealing with positions and fires and might get caught up in a little internet surface surfing who knows working on some kind of project around the house or something before i know it it's almost to close and i've got to hurriedly do this research and uh and what i have been doing a little bit by the way is is coming up with a list of ones that i might want to trade try a little bit earlier in the day and then that way later in the day i'm not um i'm not working here's, a, here's that project i was working on but here's the uh that's a list of IPOs I was looking at over the last few days. <laughs> very uh, <laughs> sticky note, very uh, very serious filing system I got here. I should stick that in my trading journal. Anyway, a point, uh, long story endless, sometimes it's just not enough time to do all these things. Now, lots of questions coming in. So, so check multiple sources when you get these things. Now, the other thing, and I think it's going to come up in a, in a few minutes with one of these, but if not, what happens lately, it seems like, um, and it might be this VTEX or it might be another one. I forget which one it is, and I forget if I had the slide in here tonight or not. But sometimes these, um, and it might be this one, sometimes these SPOCs, when they become the new company, they they look like an IPO, even though it becomes a new company. And I think that the original company was A1, the letter A-O-N-E, and it became something else. It might have become this stock, okay? My data provider gives the dates of the first trading date on a major exchange and defines the IPO for me. And that defines the IPO for me. Yeah, well, if you look at, if you look at bit F, in the telechart, like I showed earlier, and you do a little research on it, the first day of, of major trading, and I think it was VidF, was on the NYSE or, or uh, one of these stocks in here tonight. And it looks like it IPO'd on that date, but it, that's actually the date that it acquired 
the SPOC or the SPOC turned into the stock, however you want to look at that. So I hear what you're saying, but that that still needs to be possibly researched further, unless we're um, talking about two different things. Okay, Jeff Long says, I make a quick list, watch list on Think or Swim every day with the ones I want to watch. Yeah, that's something that that's that needs to be done. I, one day I need to staff up. I've been saying that for 10 years. <laughs> but it's like I got the IPOs, I got the crypto. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of Forex in a while. There's just too much going on. In fact, I don't even know if I can get into my Forex account. I got to unlock it or something because I changed computers and it's kind of a mess. But I've got enough going on without that. And then there's not much going on, like I said, with the position trading, as you'll see in a few minutes. But there's still a tremendous amount of analysis there, plus this show, plus the stock chart show, plus the Facebook group. And I'm starting to get overwhelmed, start thinking about it all. But hey, you know what? I'm having fun. <laughs> you know, it's like I actually wake up and look forward to getting out of bed Sundays to do all this stuff, especially if things are going well. But yeah, Jeff, that's a great idea. And that's something that I, I try to do every day. And then when we went through this period of not a whole lot of stocks to trade, I, I, I used to put the Landry list every day and think of swim. So at least I'd see what was moving and what's happening and all. But yeah, that's a that's a great idea. But sometimes you have to remember to look at the watch list because I missed one stock today that I was that I traded yesterday and was profitable in. And of course, you got to be careful. But I felt myself thinking, you know what, I think I could go in and and trade this again today, and I missed it, and that was coin. I missed the the big intraday move today because I was chasing another rabbit, but that's a whole nother story. But yeah, I, I, I did have that on the watch list. I, I should have paid more attention to the watch list. And my problem with the watch list is that I put today's stuff in, then I put, then when things come off, I don't always take them off, which is fine for a while because you do want those older stocks on your watch list to stay in there just in case they wake up again. But eventually you get a whole bunch of stocks and you find yourself kind of ignoring some or whatever, and you end up missing the moves. Anyway, let me get back on task here. So this VTAC is kind of an interesting situation. And this is your range for the first week plus of trading, I guess two weeks in this case. And it has an okay range. This is probably not a perfect example of the range but one of the issues we've encountered with the buy b through the through the practice of it over the last i guess seven years since it's been public is that sometimes you have a narrow range which i say to avoid but then that range sort of gets made on that wide range bar breakout day okay so it's like if the range is wide enough and then all of a sudden it breaks out and now the range is wide, wide enough. So that's where it gets a little tricky because you might not have been watching this particular one on that particular day. And that could that could be a bit of a problem. The other thing is, and this is this isn't an extreme example. I did end up passing on this trade because it was it was close to 30 bucks. I like them under 20, as you know. And it's like, just had a few things going on. It's just like, oh, geez, I'm going to buy into this five-point range. And although sometimes with IPOs, those could be your best trades, you know? So anyway, so I, I passed on this one. I think I ended up with STVN. I don't know if I have a chart on that one or not. But this is a couple of issues that come up. Again, when you have the narrow range and that, and that, that true range is made or the range expands on that one day that it triggers, and of course in this case it's it's kind of close to 30 that's another issue so there are some issues with some of these stocks and again you can see your trigger there was on expansion of range okay i have a rule that limits wide range bars that entry bars but vtex made it through that filter yeah and see that's what i'm saying it was kind of on the cusp and and you know, like I said a second ago, not not that I want to make a big old fat excuse for not being a better trader, but it's like if memory serves, yesterday it was crazy around the close. I had a lot of stuff to get out of. I had to deal with some options that I had to get out of, and then I also was getting into another IPO, and then that one was like, okay, I just didn't have enough time, and I was like, okay, this it looks like 
maybe the range is too wide. I'm having a hard time buying into that. It's like I needed a second to think, and it didn't take that minute. So that that's my fault on that one. But yeah, that's a that's a good. I hear you on that. My only caution, David, is that I I know you noodle with these things and noodle them to death. And if memory serves, you're an engineer by prior trade or something precise. I forget what because uh, I've got so many Davids, I get them mixed up every now and then. I know you do the research and all, but anyway, um, be careful not to try to quantify things too much. Physicists, yeah, even worse. I knew it was I knew it was like an engineer times ten or something. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so as a physicist, you know, it's kind of like a. It's, not that I ever watched it, but but I saw a clip where they asked uh, the guy from Third Rock from the Sun. Was that the name of the show? It's like, uh, what's he's like, oh, what do you do? I'm a physicist. What's new in physics? And he says nothing. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like so there are all these rules and things and conservation of energy and all these other uh, deals. And, um, so you're probably thinking along the lines of precision and you got to be a little careful and it's one thing that i don't have time to get into tonight uh doesn't mean i'm not going to get into it but uh one of the things i was writing about was flow days where you have um and not that's not that that doesn't sound good does it <laughs> i'm having a heavy flow day no that doesn't work uh we'll have to call them something else but you know sometimes you get into what i not what i call flow uh, Mihaly Chismihaly or something like that he's got a name about that long talks about you get into the state of flow and sometimes with these patterns and, and with these the, with the trading you get into the state of flow where it becomes more of a feel than precise measurements now ironically I guess <laughs> I am going to talk about some precise measurements here in just one second so I'll take the evidence of testing for 2007 forward versus my intuition any day. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, that's fine. Uh, and and the, the more, you know, I was thinking about that today because sometimes, especially, you know, not with the core methodology, that's, that's almost, I've done that so long, I could do that with my eyes closed, so to speak. But with a lot of stuff that I'm doing, such as the intraday trading, which we're gonna talk about in just one second, I haven't defined it enough to where I have the 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 backing of being completely sure about everything i'm doing not that you're ever completely sure about everything you're doing but i have a lot less of that in the intraday trading and maybe i need more of this quantitative research that i'm going to show you in just one second to kind of give me that feel for the intuition but yeah however you get to putting on a trade and more importantly accepting that trade that's that's up to you and if you do that through a lot of quantitative analysis i get there through a lot of empirical research through looking at a lot of charts through going through those 2000 stocks or however many it is every night to get a feel for what's happening internally what's happening in the markets and then seeing some something take off without me and you know that can be a downer because it happens nearly every night because I'm looking at all these charts, right? And I'm like, oh, oh, geez, as we say in Fargo, <laughs> usually they something a little worse than that. But yeah, it could be a little frustrating seeing that you're missing some of these things. But anyway, I like to do things, as you know, a little bit more empirically. Okay, so MKFG, not only is IPOs, and that was day five there. And you could see that, it sort of barely triggered on that day, but technically that was a buy at B. You could argue that the range might have been a little small, and it is smallish, okay? But I think this company has a little excitement behind it, or certainly a technology that people might think is exciting. I think it's some sort of 3D printing or something. Anyway, it was also some kind of spock related stock. So there's the trades in. Again, my more active account that I like to show trades in. And as I'm putting this together, I'm like, oh, look at this. I got in in after hours trading. And the reason I did that 
was because I missed it in the regular session and it looked like it was worth going after in after hours. Now that's kind of an anomaly because usually if you miss them in regular session, because IPOs in general tend to be a little tender, thinner, it's a little harder to get in. But I did get in after hours. And as I said in yesterday's stock chart show, there's going to be a, a webinar one day I'm going to give, and I'm not going to use the phrase intuition versus intuition. And I guess today is not going to be that day. That's a Ned Sakota phrase. I met uh, Mrs. Sakota once, nice guy. Anyway, you could see that it's not a real solid entry, and I often preach that you need to have a fairly definitive entry for the buy at B. But in this case, I knew it was I knew it triggered, and I paid up for it a little bit in after hours trading to get a position. I'm glad I did, obviously. And the IPT was up here, and if you guys remember, I think we talked about this one back here. And I put out a post when it was closing in on my profit target. Instead of trying to get that exact profit target, I put in a trailing stop because it looked like a wide range bar day was developing. And I know you shouldn't use the word hope in this business, but I was hoping it would follow through at the velocity it was going. I'm thinking this thing might be up two or three points by the end of the day. Or four or five points. And I'm going to trail that stop higher and if you go back to the order i just showed you'll see that i had a trailing stop of 0.25 25 cents so when i get stopped out i'm still going to make the line share of the first loaf and i'll still have a second loaf on for here comes that word you should never use for hopefully a longer term trend now in this case it didn't work out and you could argue in hindsight well dave you should have grabbed it at 11 while it was there because that's where your profit target was two points higher i'm like well yeah, I'm okay with giving up a little bit of those open profits in attempt to squeeze something out. What are you giving up and what are you getting? Shit, that could be that could be a trading lesson in and of itself. What are you giving up and what are you giving? All right, getting. Um, well, I'm giving up 25 cents and I was looking to flip out a thousand shares. Let's just not think about the first loaf at this point out of those two thousand shares. So twenty-five dollars per thousand. If it doesn't quite, if it uh, comes back in, if my math is correct, or is that a little bit more than that? Is that $250? Long day. Anyway, I'm only giving up a quarter of a point. I can live with that. That is $250, isn't it? But I have the chance of possibly making a few thousand dollars more should this thing continue to run. Now, how often did it continue to run? Not that often, but every now and then I'll get in one and it'll run a long ways and it's worthwhile doing. Now, here's another one that I got in, and day five is right there, and it was another one of those mediocre type of triggers, and this slide is out of order, but getting back to the MKFG, when I researched this one, this is the one, David, that I was tell telling you about. It started trading on NYSC on this day here, but it sure looks like this stock had some prior trading happening. And this is one of those strange SPOC situations. Now, one of you guys in the group, and it might be John Ross, who's here tonight and does a lot of IPO stuff. He's our resident guru in the uh, Facebook group on IPOs. And, and one of you guys might have been John. It's one of the Johns. And uh, you were saying, or you brought up the point that when these SPOCs do their little deal, a lot of times they take off, and and here's hoping. There's that word again, I know, but here's hoping that the MTTR, which was GHVI, takes off soon. Okay, and it had an okay day today, knock on wood. But anyway, so this is another one of those tricky situations where I saw it in one feed and took it as a buy at B, and then when you do a little research, it didn't. It actually traded under another ticker. And then so now it's kind of muddies the water. So kind of got lucky on that mistake, so to speak, if it is truly a mistake. Now, one thing I want to point out is, and I thought I had another one too, but there's been a couple of these IPOs recently, these IPOs, I'm going to do some air quotes, that 
that aren't completely IPOs like that MKFG or whatever. You could argue that it traded before. And one of those other ones I was talking about or, or, or thinking about at least. And as of going live tonight, I think there's kind of a hidden lesson in all this, or we're kind of backing into something by accident. Even if those weren't legitimate setups by my initial rules, okay, they were conceptually correct at least because the market's going the right way. So, but that's not the point. The point is that maybe, just maybe through proper money management, we'll be able to stay with these positions, we be me, I guess in this case, and ride them out for a long, long time. All right, let's clear up the IPO stuff and then we'll shift gears here. And we can come, we'll come back to it, of course, in the live charts. All right, let me get some of these questions out of here. All right, John says, buy a P goes with the market sideways and choppy and not good from, from there, 678 stocks this year, that is three, that is 367% more than the same time in 2020, which had 148. 45. Okay, so there's 300. There's a there's a boatload of IPOs. Yeah, there's just a there's just flooding the market with them, and I hear you. And you know, one thing that people people look at, not to go off on too much of a tangent. Imagine that, but I think one of the problems with with quantifying a bunch of stuff is you're you're going to look at all these IPOs flooding the market right now, and quite frankly, to put it bluntly, a lot of them are going to be turds, right? You know. You can't, uh, what's the old saying? You can't polish a turd. Although I think Mythbusters proved that wrong, but uh, you, you can roll in the glitter. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I digress. Eighth grade human or nine, huh? No, the thing is, I think if you go in and try to quantify them, you're going to find that most of them are crappy and just, just fail miserably. And And that's a danger in doing something like that. And I've seen a lot of people say, how horrible the IPO market is, and that's some of my absolute best trading when that occurs, because those one or two or three or four that I'm in take off, maybe not four, but maybe one or two, and it just seems like they work really, really well during certain times. Interesting, 678 IPOs this year. Yeah, my IPO list is huge. Wow, that's crazy. They're up 367% increase in IPOs. So there's almost four times as many IPOs coming public. Bybee goes with the market side with a choppy not as good. Okay, are you saying, John, that when the market is sideways, because like it would, what I'm seeing is that, okay, I can't find anything to trade to save my life with the core methodology, which is fine, completely fine. And, you know, as soon as I get an email from somebody that says, hey, Dave, I don't see any setups in the near future. I'm going to go take a week's vacation. That's usually right about the time we hit. So why don't you guys email me with that so we could start getting setups again, even if you're just kidding. <laughs> but one thing, that's that's the only place I'm finding opportunity. So you're saying that when the market is headed higher, the IPOs work a lot better. I, I've noticed that in the past when there was this this crazy influx of these phone traders and the whole world went speculative crazy and everybody in that brother was trading and everybody in that brother was calling me up hey dave i just started trading last month i'm up 40 percent. is that about right can i expect it every month i'm like no 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 anyway Agreed. You just got to make a rule when to consider an IPO and stick to it. Okay. Yeah. You know, I hear you. And I guess that's some, that's a, one disadvantage of being a discretionary trader. A hundred percent discretionary is you do miss some of these things. I think that the advantages through experience of, of the getting in tune with the market, sometimes you might pick up on something that wouldn't quite fit that mechanical uh, switch. But like I said earlier, when we, when you're working on something and you want to be more confident in it, sometimes it's okay to 
do a little quantifying, which I'm going to show you right now. Now, as you know, I've been talking a lot about, on and off at least, for the last couple of years, about Holy Grail day hunting. And Holy Grail day is a wide range bar, and it could be in a stock or an ETF, but I've been focusing on ETFs for this particular strategy, and then use other strategies in the core trades to try to catch that holy grail day and obviously open a gap reversals to try to catch that holy grail day but her holy grail day starts at one end ends at the other and i did i don't know if that'll come out on the camera but last week i was talking about some of the research that i did where i program in the holy grail days and go in and watch last week's week of charts especially if you have trouble sleeping and where I talk a lot about the Holy Grail days. And there's certain things that I've been doing to, to find those Holy Grail days. Well, one thing that I found is sometimes it helps when you're working on a project like that, instead of looking for the exact thing you're looking for, maybe look for some things that you're not looking for and how do you avoid those things and where i'm going with all this is i'll print money in etfs and this is especially true in like the the s p futures right and that's why you don't hear me talk tremendously about the s p futures because it's such a difficult market to trade and like i'll do really well in the s p futures and then i get chewed up chewed up chewed up chewed up chewed up and I think some of the discoveries I'm going to share with you tonight might help you from getting chewed up as much. It's certainly going to help me from getting chewed up as much in the S&P futures. But anyway, the formula for trading success is obviously figure out when to trade, okay? I can't find a setup to save my life right now. Sit on your hands. Look at where the S&P has been. Look at where the Russell's been. Look at where the NASDAQ has been. Today, notwithstanding. It's been all over the place and chopping sideways. Well, I don't feel so bad about not recommending any core position trades and not taking any core position trades during that time. Now, I've taken some intraday ETFs. I've taken some ogres, uh, some of which I wish I wouldn't have, but that's another story. And I've also done, obviously, some IPO trades. But figure out when to trade, when, when conditions are conducive for your methodology. And probably more important is figure out when not to trade. In fact, that's the real holy grail. Like I said a minute ago, I can do really well in S&P futures, especially, you know, give me a nice fat wide range bar day and I'll just ride the mess out of them and take partial profits and I'll just sit on them all day long. And it's just, it's like butter. And the same thing, obviously, for ETFs. My problem, though, is getting chewed up in between. Maybe part of that's a little bit ego, admittedly. But it's got me really thinking where I need to focus as much on when to trade. I'm sorry. I need to focus as much on when not to trade as I do on when to trade. And also here, my life's going to get a lot easier, especially with this intraday stuff, because I feel like I had a lot more freedom before I did as much intraday trading as I'm doing now. I've always done a little day trading here and there, but now I am just because there's so much going on with business, I'm, I tend to be stuck here. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I'm stuck here. So I'm here anyway. So that's why I'm, I'm working on a lot of these things as, as side projects. And as I've been calling them profit centers, if I can make this profit center to generate, and I hate to use the word income, but to generate because it's hard to generate income through the market. You can generate capital gains, but you, it's hard to say you want a paycheck from the market. And that, that goes all the way back to the living war days. But if I could generate some sort of profit center to where it's profitable over the short to intermediate term, then that's an additional way to build wealth. Or in my case, as I was talking with one of you guys last week, I'm taking half of those profits and I'm putting them towards fun stuff so I don't have to borrow money if I want to do something and not go into saving or go into savings or whatever the case may be. I just I just pay for it. And 
I don't want to make it sound easier than it is because it's it's hard to try to produce to try to make money over a set time frame under that pressure. You have to seeing like you don't need the money, as one of my clients often says. Anyway, just real quick, this is the service portfolio coming in today. You'll notice I have no setups. Excuse me, recommended. And that goes all the way back to the middle of July. And I hope we have something to do soon. And I think we're getting there. But I'm not going to force the issue. I'm going to let the market come to me. The only thing that scares me a little bit, and last time we went through this phase this bad, I think it was last summer, no, summer before last, it was this bad. The one day out of the blue, we had two setups, and it was right after somebody emailed me and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to take a break for a little while. <laughs> and those turned out to be two of the biggest winners of the year. I don't know, I've said that a thousand times. But one of the problems with trading momentum is the outlier effect. You miss a couple of outliers, your year's not as good as it could have been. And we just had like, I wish CPE was still in here so I could show you, but CPE was up 600% at one point. And believe me, this number down here looked a hell of a lot better. But if you miss those few outliers or, and those outliers come like after a period of inactivity, then you gotta be really careful. And the, the other thing that's a bit of a paradox is, your best trading tends to come after, well, your best trading tends to come after your worst trading, and your worst trading, unfortunately, tends to come after your best trading. But along the lines of setups, your best setups tend to come after when you don't have any setups for a while, because everything's sort of, as Livermore said, all the people that are in and out, in and out, they're laying the foundation for your next venture. Now, I hate to say that too much because it puts a lot of pressure on me and a lot of expectations from you that, hey, the next setup he recommends might be the one. Give me give me four or five. Give me the next, within the four or five next setups. Obviously, I can't guarantee it, but I'd, I'd be willing to bet, and boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang myself here, but I'd be willing to bet out of the next five setups, we have one big winner that makes it all worthwhile and we'll see we'll see it and, and, and now i'm a little nervous but i think I, I, i'm feeling it i think we can make it happen all right so getting back to the intraday stuff with the leverage etfs and again this is kind of um an ancillary thing i'm doing now it's kind of s and g's but if i can make this work longer term i could turn it into a profit center profit center I borrowed that term from Linda Rasky, and she talked about people would come come and go uh, in her office, and they would be into different things. And Linda would say, well, let's model it out and see if we could turn it into a profit center, kind of like what David does in here, as opposed to just kind of going by feel, which is probably I'm a little bit more guilty of. But anyway, but one guy seemed to be kind of willy-nilly in what he was doing, and she's like, well, look, let's let's – Let's noodle with this a little bit, and if we can make it work, we'll throw a little money at it, and we'll make it a profit center. So that's kind of my goal with all this. So a couple of weeks ago, I said that on July 22nd, I didn't have any trades in these ETFs, and they all made inside day. So this is something I've been watching for quite a while, is maybe consider no action as long as it is currently an inside day. Now the caveat to that would be, and I don't know if the camera's still on, but if you got a wide range bar, then an inside day, then the range could be big enough on that inside day for trading. But as a general rule, not a hard and fast rule, but as a general rule, if something is chopping within the prior day's range, just sit on your hands a little bit and see where it goes. Or at the least, and I'm kind of thinking out loud here, at the least, as long as it's in a narrow range, wait for two or three fake outs, okay, for that market to truly find its way. And if you miss the, the first one or two or three fake outs, there's no guarantee that you're going to make money on a trade, but at least you didn't go in two or three times and lose three, two or three times in a row trying to catch that trend. So 
I'm beginning to think more and more that less is more because if you catch a day like this here, which if memory serves, I think I did okay on. Let me check real quick. Uh, that's the 14th. And you could avoid those choppy days in between. I don't know if this notebook goes back that far. You'll do pretty darn good. What's it, Lab U? So it'd have been in what, Lab D? Please work, please work, please work. No, I didn't make a lot of money on a day. I don't know. No, 15, oh, 14, 14. Whew. Here it is. Lab D. Yeah, yeah, I had one of my, I had, I had a big day, or decent day at least, in, in that one account. And I have a loss of 216, but then I see overall I made 718 on that day. So it was a good day, just in this one, one ETF, you know? Now, did I keep all that? I don't know, because I know I might have gotten sucked in on one of these other days. So make good money, make $1,000 or whatever, and then figure out how long you sit on your hands until you can make another thousand dollars so here's the premise of something i was thinking about and about a month ago i mentioned this and i didn't get around to changing over my computer or putting the new code in or whatever or, or i wasn't aware that it carried over so I had an indicator, which I started working on last few days again, where it would tell me the range of the market relative to the longer term average true range and the intraday range, which is the only range obviously you could trade if you're trading intraday. And I talked to you guys about it, I mentioned that, okay, if we're at less than 50% of that intraday range, then you might not have the, the ATR, right? The average true range, then you might not have a holy grail day in the works, at least not yet. Now, let me just show you where my line of thinking is, and then it'll make a lot, it'll make a lot more sense when we get to the formula and the charts. So the ABC is a technical analysis, obviously, as I often say, if a market's gonna go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. And that's how I came up with buy at B. You can't just blindly buy a market when it's breaking out at the B level, so to speak, except for in markets that adhere to breakout characteristics. And possibly if you'd like a go-go crazy Robin Hood market, maybe in those cases you can play the breakouts. Breakouts more often than not fail, except in IPOs and except if, in your, if you're in a really, really go-go market, so to speak. Now, my premise here is that a wide range bar, WRB, C, okay, let's define a wide range bar C, because that's the ultimate, can't happen until the range becomes greater than B. So an NRB, a narrow range bar, okay, and then you have an MRB, a medium range bar, and then at the top, you have a wide range bar. So let's say A is an NRB and C is a WRB, well then, Obviously, to pass through B, the MRB, the NRB has to become a MRB to become a WRB. Okay? Got that? <laughs> to me, it's just like an epiphany. Like, wow, this is, it's one of those things that's, that's on the surface just seems so damn easy. And then when you're living through it, it's just so damn hard. But and that's that's why trading is so elusive because it, the concept, the basic concept, just capture a price move. That's all you got to do, right? It's so, can be so elusive at times. But that's why I always preach you want to keep it as simple as possible. So, looking at this chart, at the bottom of this chart, here's the actual formula. And I did write it with inputs, but just to make the math easy, 10 is what I'm doing for all these studies, and probably 10 is what I'll stick with for the ATR. And the range is just the high minus low. And that's this is a live number here, the high minus low. And then I multiply it by 100 to get the percentage. Now, I'm using a percentage in this chart and for my research in Thinkorswim because I don't know how to put this in a separate window as an indicator. I've got them all in one indicator window, like 
it would be like down here, I've got like three indicators or illustrators as I like to call them. So I don't multiply by 100. So let's say the range is five for the day on whatever I'm looking at. And my number is 0.75 for this little range indicator. Well, I know just looking at that, okay, that's 75%. So the range is 75% of what it normally is. Anyway, it helps to make me think twice about getting in on a narrow range bar, especially if the narrow range bar, we don't know where it's gonna be by the end of the day, obviously. If we did, you never see, if I did, you never see my fat ass again. But we know that it's, at the moment, it's in a little narrow range and we don't wanna be trading it. But if that range begins to increase and maybe it increases more than 50%, then maybe, just maybe, we have a possible wide range bar in the works. And that would be some fodder for research. How many times does the market get past X in its range? And let's just say X is 51%, whatever. How many times does it go to 100% of that ATR? And that might be something worth studying in and of itself. Now, I drew some lines in here, and you could actually have these draw automatically. By the way, any, if you have Metastock, I'll give you these formulas. As I've said a lot of times, I use a lot of tools in my business, probably more than I really need. But like in my personal life, I have a bit of a tool fetish. I ordered, ordered some tools today off Amazon, you know. <laughs> my wife, every now and then, she'll go in the garage because everything's a mess. She's like, what's this? And like, I don't know. It's a, it, it, does this or whatever. Well, where do you want to put it? Like, oh, geez. <laughs> I'll pick it up later. I promise. No, I won't. Anyway, I have a boatload of tools, and and in some of the, in post, I'll put a picture of my tool cart up in here, just to show you some of the tools I have. But anyway, I use a lot of tools, and I'm I kind of it's kind of a sickness with me in in my personal life, and I probably use too many tools in my trading life. But there's so many things that just seem to work so well for certain things. And then, as I've said before, the good folks over at Stock Charts are, are helping me to incorporate a lot of these things into their platform. But it's kind of like the ones that I'm used to using, I just kind of not ready to give them up just yet. But anyway, so you don't have to run out and do meta, use Metastock, I think is what I'm saying. Although I am I, I am an affiliate for Metastock. If you're, if you're interested, let me know. And obviously I'm not an affiliate for Stock Charts, but I'm a big fan of their stuff and you'll see a lot of their stuff in these presentations obviously especially the acp platform so i would definitely check that out too and i use that i use that daily by the way and i do a lot of stuff there and especially the multiple volatilities with this etf stuff and maybe next week i'll make a note and i'll revisit that but anyway getting back to these ranges in here this is 50 percent. this is 75% and this is 100%. And I'm just kind of noodling with these numbers, but I thought 50% would be a good number. And if a market is below 50% of its average range, now we're just measuring high to low because that's all you can trade if you're trading intraday, right? Like it was for these three days here. And I'll need to go, I have to go in and look at, it's harder for me to get daily records on futures than it is stocks, but I have to figure out how to do that. But I need to go, but of course, now that I'm starting to write them all down, I can see. But if I can go in and look at those three days, hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, well, I guess hopefully in this case, hopefully I didn't trade during those three days because the range was so damn narrow. But I've got that indicator up and running again on Think or Swim to help me to make sure that. If it's down at 30, and like I saw one of them today, or recently was down at 20 or 30%, and it just kind of stayed there all day. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna trade this until it begins to move. And then maybe if it is stuck at, let's say 30% of the normal daily range, okay, then maybe put some alerts in there and then go off and, you know, I have an exercise in two weeks, or, or at least during the week, on the weekend sometimes I'll, I'm trying to ride bike or walk, you know, whatever. But because I've been so busy with all this stuff, it's like I've been forgetting to to exercise. That's one of the downsides of doing all this intraday trading. And I also feel like as soon as I leave, something's going to happen. So try to put some 
things in place to where you can still have a life if you are doing some of this stuff. Now, the, the good news is on a lot of this stuff, there's no reason to sit there and watch a screen all day once you enter your orders. Just let them work. And we talked about this last week. Use a stop entry order to get you in, and then use a limit order to get you out of half and a trailing stop automated on the other half. Now, if you've been trading for more than a day, especially if you're trading something like S&P futures or some sort of index product, you'll know that, as I said earlier, you'll print money on some days, but then you get chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up. And those little three days, I think that's a, I think that's three birds crapping on a wire for those uh, candle people in here. <laughs> Somebody's going to be watching on YouTube. They're going to hit pause, and they're going to be like looking through all the books. Three birds crapping on a wire. What's that pattern? No, I think it's a fat sumo wrestler just sat on a baby or something. Anyway, the reason I pick up the candle people is it's always a pattern, okay? That's a major reversal pattern, okay? Well, what is it reversing? The market's chopping sideways, you know? It's like, okay, whatever. Anyway, so those are bad days to trade, obviously. You can see the range. Now, it's in hindsight, but the range never got above 50%. But what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to, get to here is before that turns into a wide range bar it's going to have to be more than a narrow range bar so as long as it's a narrow range bar okay you come in on let's say this day here and it looks like you're looking at a 15 minute bar and it's about that big and it looks like it's going to the moon well plot yourself a daily chart and say well hang on we're right in here and then if you have the luxury of having a little indicator and i'll give you my code if you want my code that's fine and you could program that in to say, well, wait a minute, we're only at 27% or 30% of the normal range. Maybe I need to sit on my hands and let everybody else fight it out a little bit. Maybe wait for that, those one or two or three fake outs. And sometimes you get a narrow range bar and it starts to expand on the downside and you gotta be careful. Don't get too excited right when it starts to expand, but it might take out that prior low and then reverse and start heading higher and still watch your range. But if that range starts increasing, then you might have you a trade on your hands, and at least you missed a bad trade or two. So here's another little period, just eyeballing this chart. You can see three days here where, yeah, it went higher over three days. If you're in a position, that's great. You're feeling pretty good. But if you tried to trade these three days, long and or short, you probably would have gotten chewed up on those days. Now, I thought it would be cool to put a little skull and crossbones on the chart or have it programmed in whenever you were less than 50%. So in this day here, this range was less than 50% of the normal range, okay? And by the way, in TradeStation, TradeStation, I'm dating myself. I guess TradeStation is still around, isn't it? Yeah, I used, I used TradeStation like 20 years ago or more. Oh, God. In the, in the late 90s, 95? Jeez, oh my God, I'm getting old. Anyway, that's making me nervous. <laughs> and the problem is like, oh, I'll be dead by then. I mean, he's always saying that lately. So like, stop saying that. I mean, saying, he's like a month younger than me. Anyway, I got it programmed in to where if it's less than 50%, it puts a little skull and crossbones on the chart. Now, this is after the fact because this is daily data. But I, I can go back in and do a little analysis and I see a little skull and crossbone and I know, okay, so I know that I shouldn't have been trading on that day. How many, how many times have you gone in on an intraday trade and at the end of the day, go in and look at the chart and it looks like that. It's a little narrow range and like, what the hell is I thinking? Not only that, it was an inside day. So I'm trying to reduce the number of what the hell is I thinking moments. And you could see that also was an inside day on that particular day. And getting and that was uh that was biotech. That was lab U. So here's the gold minder, gold minders, gold miners. Okay. And you could see now, by the way, maybe an opening gap reversal, even though it's still a narrow range day might be a, a case where you could possibly get in, but even still, you want to be careful and, and maybe wait for a fake out too, and maybe wait for a little bit of range expansion before getting in. But if you take a look at that day there, a little skull and crossbones, you can see, getting ahead of myself here, oops, hit the wrong button. 
So you can see that your intraday range was less than 50%, okay? And if you look at the next day, expand that out, you can see that this day is contained within this day. So that's two days, even if this range is bigger than this one, right, that are still contained within the prior day. And I think Toby Crable has done that type of work too. So you can see that, yeah, the range increased, but you're still stuck within this range over here, which was a fairly narrow range day. So maybe I want to sit on my hands a little bit, or maybe in this case, you got lucky and said, well, the range hasn't expanded, but it did tail lower. And I don't know which way the market went on this day. We'll have to look. This is on August 3rd. It's funny, wants to pull up an intraday chart and look at it. This is JDST. Maybe you decided, well, it's, it, it did expand a little bit to the downside and maybe trap some people in. So I'm going to go ahead and play it to the upside. But as a general statement, just in perfect hindsight, that does not look like a good day to trade. But look what happened the day after. It looks pretty good. So as I said a second ago, the inside day within an inside two days within the prior range, this one technically an inside day, this one not, this one not either, but still contained within the prior day's range. Okay. So I call those an ID two, if you ever see my little chart. Now here's something that I thought was amazing, and I got pretty excited when I saw this. As I've said ad nauseum tonight, my big problem is I get an S&P futures, make a lot of money, I feel like God, right? And then I get chewed up the next three or four days. Well, when I plotted this little skull indicator, which shows me which days are narrow range bar days, where, and you could say, well, it's in hindsight. Well, not exactly because it might have been all day long, right? But in fact, it was all day long because at the end of the day, think about this. Every skull I have, skull and crossbones I have on here, is on a day where the range not never got above 50%. So if it was below 50% of the 10-day ATR, okay, which includes gaps, but your intraday range is not greater than 50%, then you probably don't want to be trading on that day. Now, if I, when I have time someday, haha, -ha, but I have been doing more and more of this type of analysis, and by the way, this is one reason I love my educational business because it forces me to do a lot of this stuff. I, I knowing myself, I would probably wing it a lot, <laughs> a lot more than I do. I probably wing it a little too much here and there, but I wouldn't get up at 4:55 every morning and stay here 12 hours working on this stuff, right? And I wouldn't do so much introspection. I'd probably just kind of sweep some of the stuff out under the rug and go home and do whatever. But having an educational business forces me to cement a lot of what I'm doing, even though it is still discretionary. But to my amazement, look at all these days in here. I would love to know, and someday I just need to do it. It's going to be painful. But I would love to know how much money I lost, add up all these skull and crossbone days. And remember, it seems like it's in hindsight, but at the end of the day, this is an end of the day reading. So we know that these are bad days, but we also know that the indicator during the day never got about 50%. And to me, this is amazing. I discovered this earlier today and I just couldn't wait to show you guys. And, and you know, if you're new to trading, you're probably like, what the hell is he talking about? If you, you know what, if you're new to trading, go out and trade E-minis for about two months, okay? on an intraday basis, and they get back to me. I bet you could be like, Dave, Dave, what was that thing you showed me and not the trade? Can you explain that again? <laughs> but this should get you excited. I mean, all these little these little skull and crossbone days on, on when not to trade, S&P futures or intraday ETFs or whatever other, you know, pick your favorite market you want to go in on an intraday basis. David Singletary says, I want to party with you. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Did I just say that? You're probably thinking I want to party with you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> anyway. Okay, a couple of random thoughts 
on not intraday trading ETFs based on intraday range. And we could certainly talk a lot more about this in future shows. And I know here's the thing, you know, it's probably 90% of the people's eyes going to glaze over and there's 10% of people that are probably chomping at the bit to get um, at all this. Or is it champing at the bit? I think that was a line of billionaires. Skull, NRBs, skull days, okay, NRBs, narrow range, NRBs appear to be in hindsight, and this is what I was saying a second ago, yet you know intraday if they are still below 50% of average, so at least that helps. And I never realized how important this percent of range was when I put it in think or swim God knows how long ago, probably a year ago or more. And then when I changed computers, I lost it and downloaded new software and got all set up and maybe it was still there. I didn't know it, but I just got it set up again this week, a couple of days ago. I have to say it's keeping me out of a lot of bad trades so far. So I'm pretty excited about that. So anyway, the point I just made was even though they appear to be completely in hindsight, the ones that are skulls stayed below 50% the whole day. So just by not trading until it's at least 50% or it looks like it's gonna break through that 50% or if you had one or two fake outs, okay? So this is not a be all end all tool, but it's a tool I think that could lead to something much bigger. Now the downside is that you potentially give up the amount of minimum range you require. So it's like, okay, I need this much range before I go in and it only goes that much, okay? So that that is a bit of a danger, and you could always, you could, as always, I should say, end up buying the exact high tick, the exact high, thinking that the range would will continue to expand. I bought the exact high tick a couple times last week, okay? So don't rush out and, and try this stuff at home until you begin to wrap your head around it. And that is one of the downsides of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, as opposed to maybe if you were a little bit more aggressive and didn't wait for all this confirmation, you might have gotten in and got a little piece out and scratch out on, on the remainder or whatever, as opposed to possibly buying the high tick. Reason I'm telling you this is I don't want to, you could see, you could hear my excitement, at least I hope you can, about this stuff, but you got to realize that you could still, there's a downside to this type of thing too. There's always a downside to whatever you do, believe it or not, or in trading, I don't think that's hard to believe. Anyway, that's why I brought that up. So a couple of things more on not putting capital into harm's way. And again, this is just one little tool I think we could use to help us stay out of these choppy markets or when the market is choppy. So be leery of the first 15 minute bar fake outs. That doesn't mean that you'd never want to trade on the first 15 minute bar. As I say, ad nauseum, sometimes that might be the big move, the biggest move or the whole move of the day is in that first 15 minutes. But sit on your hands a little bit. Maybe look at that, that 50% indicator. And if you're down around 27% or 23%, and it looks this big on a 15 minute chart, but it looks about that big. When you look at a daily chart, so look at that daily chart too. It might keep you from getting in on that first or second or third fake out. So again, watch your daily charts. And then I don't know about you, but there's been many a times where I've made some intraday trades. And at the end of the day, I look in the ranges about that big. And I'm like, I'm such an idiot. Why did I, why did I even bother trading? Why was I, because I was trying to generate some income, you know, it's like, as opposed to, hey, you know what, we're not going to generate any income today, but we're not going to lose any either, you know, in order to make money, it's important not to lose too much money. You're going to have to lose some money to make money, but when you don't have to lose money, don't lose money. <laughs> Write that down. Whenever I speak to a foreign audience and I go, write that down, it's like, they all write it down. Like, it's like... <laughs> Anyway, again, watch your daily charts, time travel. Like, how are you going to feel at the end of the day if you got this little tiny inside day and you bought that ETF, right? And you lost money on it. You're like, I'm an idiot, right? Why did I do that? So it's, and that's trading in general. That's life in general, by the way. If 
you decide you want to snap back at your wife, if there was a way to just stop for a second, and there's a neurology there too, as I've said before, you bypass that little amygdala and get to the rest of it sloshing around up there. If there was a way you could like slow things down and go, how is future Dave going to feel if he smarts off to his wife? It's like, oh, it's such a good, such a good little quip. Oh, oh. <laughs> anyway, how are you going to feel at the end of the day if you get caught up in a choppy market? Well, you're going to be, you're going to be pissed off because it happens and there's no way to completely avoid it. But maybe some of the research that I'm working on, and by the way, with something like TKOs and bow ties and all this other stuff, I've done it for so long, I have a really good feel, and then I know some of you guys can actually quantify it. In fact, years ago, I, there was a guy, and I actually know his name, I don't wanna say it, and I'm, I'm not, I think he's still involved in markets, but he was, he was doing some sort of, it wasn't a neural network, but it was a a learning machine to where like if things didn't work, the machine would learn whether or not they didn't work because it just was by chance, or was there was there a flaw in the methodology, or whatever? And it made me kind of nervous because I think he was getting kind of close to completely kind of mechanizing what I do, which which I think could could take the edge out if if it worked. It actually made me nervous because he was such a smart guy, or still is actually, and that I I think he was on to something there. And I was hopefully he's moved on to somebody else's methodology and, and taking the edge out of there. <laughs> anyway, that's a that's a two bit story, I suppose. Keep on you know here's the other thing too. Keep an eye on the market action. And let's say the market's going straight up and you're really liking an inverse ETF and that range is starting to expand. Yeah, it could be the mother of all moves that are negatively correlated to the market, but in general, things will stay correlated to the market. So you got to really, 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 really like a setup to swim against the tide. And that goes for Longer term trading too. If you think you have the mother of all shorts and the market's going straight up, then take it. But think really hard about taking it, okay? Because you don't want to fight the, the tide. Now, here's one thing I've been guilty of before. And the problem is I get rewarded enough on it to where I get a little cocky. And like sometimes you'll get a wide range bar tail down and the market will exhaust itself and then it'll come straight back up. And you can make a lot of money going one way, then turn around and make a lot of money going the other. Unfortunately, sometimes it does not materialize like that, obviously. And Steve Ladd, and that's going to be a, a that's a term that I use with one of my clients, and it'll probably catch on. But Steve Ladd ran his motorcycle through the tunnel of fire, and he got through the other side, and he was just so excited. He ran his motorcycle back through the tunnel of fire, and he didn't come out the other end. <laughs> you know? So it's kind of like you go way, way, way in the market, you're like, that was fun. That was great. I'm awesome. And then it's like you turn around and like go the other way. And sometimes you're you're not that good to where you can catch both sides. So it's that's a tricky thing to do. And that's where you got to be careful. Let's say you make a thousand dollars going one way in ETF. Just be if you do trade the other way and the inverse ETF, whatever the case may be, but in the other ETF that goes the other way. Just maybe trade at a smaller size just in case. So make sure you lock in the line shares for the day. Now, just for fun, at a minimum of a 75% range, would there be enough days left to trade and enough range left in the day? So there's two questions in that sentence. And I was pretty amazed at how many days and maybe David W. in here might could give me a, a mathematical explanation. But I was pretty amazed. If you bump that up to 75%, look at how many how many days you would eliminate. And would these few remaining days, like this one here for sure, right, have enough range left in them to make money? So that's that's a little fodder for research to leave you with.
But if you wait for the intraday range to expand beyond 50% ATR, haven't you missed the move? Um, well, 50%, 50 might be might be too big of a number. Okay. This is just this is kind of like new research I'm kind of bringing to light. It it all depends, but I don't I don't think that you would. And I'll tell you this for a fact. What I've seen is waiting for like 23% or, you know, it's like whatever mark was at 23% or 30% or whatever. It seems like that's that's not enough move to, to, to get in anyway. But yeah, you bring up an interesting point. And, you know, if you want to fire up your programming um, and if there's anything you want to share with us, that'd be great. But how many times when it's less than 50% does it not? I mean, you go back in and look at all those days that I just showed you where it was less than 50 percent well you you would have avoided all those days of getting chewed up and then it seems like on the big days it just seems like it's so much it's so much bigger and i don't know if you're able to see this or not oh here's a good example here but you can see like on this day here i don't know if it's going to come up on the camera you got a little tiny bar there right compared to these big old fat bars where you'd have made a lot of money so even if you take out that little tiny bar you still got a lot of money. At least that's my feeling, and you might be able to quantify it a little further. Well, you need a lot of intraday data, but you also, I think you could also get a pretty good feel, and, and you're right. Um, Stock Trust ACP has a lot of intraday data. Um, I don't think you could download it, but you might be able to do a little empirical research. But I think I think even with a daily chart, I don't think you're going to miss enough to where the trading is not worthwhile. Now maybe 50% is is too big of a number, okay? But it would be interesting to see. You, you ever get into these? And I'm going to use the word flow day again. I guess that sounds bad, but sometimes I get into flow with these. I guess Flo's not going to like that. Uh, <laughs> neither will Marcy. Um, I have to edit that out. Someday, I got to, he calls it flow. I don't know what other word to use. But sometimes you get into flow. Maybe that's what I need to say, into flow. And um, it still doesn't sound right, does it? Anyway, uh, sometimes you get into flow and these markets just keep going and going and going and going and going and going, okay? And those are the best days ever. And you're just putting on trade after trade after trade after trade. And it feels like you're getting it a little late, but they just keep going and going and going. So I, I think there's something there. And I, I, I don't think the opportunity costs are going to kill you. But I, I, like, I like that you are playing devil's advocate. So... Yeah, you know, the end, the end of day data is going to give you a lot of a lot of information. And like I just said, you know, and, and again, in teaching this stuff, I back into a lot of concepts and maybe maybe all that's needed I I, I'm beginning to think would be the daily charts. And if you really wanted to pick it apart, yeah, get into the intraday stuff, get into the weeds. But I think just the daily charts are enough to give you a pretty good idea on whether or not you should be trading or should have traded on those days. Look at all those skull and crossbones at 50%. And I don't see where any one of those days you'd have made any money. And now, if that range expanded from that, then you possibly made money. And and within that 50%, and let's say it expands, you, you're going to get that fake out probably within that 50% and then get on, a, on the other side of the market. And either, it still might be less than 50%, but at least at least by, by waiting for that range, especially to be more than like 27% or 30% or whatever, you're going to miss a fake out or two. You can't miss all fake outs. That's life. Okay. But you might miss a few of them. And I know that since I've been paying more attention to it, I seem to be missing more and more 
bad trades. Kind of running long tonight, but that's okay. Let's get through the market real quick. S&P 500 closed at all-time highs. That's obviously a good thing. As I've been telling my service peeps for a while, I'm not going to fight a market when it's at or near new highs. Yes, internally, it's been crappy. And I don't know if it's because I'm starting to pay attention to more people because I'm involved with StockCharts.com or what, but it seems like a lot of people, such as David Keller, was pointing out all the bad things going on with the market internally, and I've been noticing them too. And so it's kind of shrugging all that off, at least for now. SP at all-time highs, we're not going to argue with that. Bowtie is proper order. They have been in that for a long time. NASDAQ composite up about three quarters percent today. Bam, all-time highs. Look at how wide and loose and crazy this market has been for a long time. Let's take a measurement on that. And let's let's go back to this day here. So a couple of days ago, or three days ago, the market was flat for nearly a month, okay? And then it was up a little, down a little, and then now it's up today. This means that the big issues are doing all the pulling. That's a good point, Craig. You're probably right. Because we look take a look at the Rusty, and the Rusty still looks pretty darn toppy. Now, as Mike P said a couple of weeks ago, what if these weaker, weaker areas strengthen? And I'm like, yeah, that would really push the market higher, really, really push the market higher. You know, energies are a big component of pushing the market up, even though they can trade contra to the overall market, and even though the market can trade without them, when the energies are doing well, then it's like the market is firing on all eight cylinders, provided other areas like the semis are doing well, which we'll get to in one second. Semis had a I mean, uh, energy's had a decent rally today. A lot of support below the market. I've been seeing a lot of shorts here. I haven't gone out after any because a lot of support here on an individual issue basis. And I'm thinking, okay, I shorted up here. It's going to hit that support, bounce off of it. And it's just not worth going after. And that's why, even though you've been seeing a lot of shorts, and it'd be fun to kind of follow up on those shorts in the uh, Landry list for the past three or four weeks, we haven't taken any just for various reasons, and that being one of them. Okay, metals and mining, we're trying to get their act together, but then they got hit pretty hard today to come back in, and they're almost below the bow tie moving average. You see the bow tie moving average has crossed back to the upside, but now if they begin to fail and get back below, they'll cross right back below. By the way, I'm not excited, as excited as I said a thousand times about a high level crossing like this as I am, when it crosses to the downside from high levels, okay? So this is to the upside from high levels, not as excited as from the downside from high levels. And go in and look at the S&P 500 going back 30, 40 years and pay attention to those signals. So banks would be an, one example of those signals and see so far, it's been a pretty good run lower, choppy run, but a run lower nonetheless. Banks have been firming up a little bit in here, but they still look pretty toppy, not looking so hot. Drugs, look at that, bam, winning, all-time highs today. Pretty impressive. Biotech, not really following suit, but biotech was pretty good today. I think I did okay in biotech. I won't bore you with that, but that was one of the one areas that paid off today. And you can see, looks like a wide range bar, right? So that'll be fun to go in and do that intraday research and noodles and formulas. I know, you wanna party with me, all right? Take a look at health services, TKO there. I didn't find anything in health services, one CFMS or something, little penny stock that looked okay. But when I saw what health services looked like, I went back and took a look at all the stocks within the sector and I don't see anything worth buying. You would think it, it something to be worth buying with the overall sector looking like that. But you can see health services looks pretty good. A little bit of a knockout move today off its worst levels, but still looking pretty darn good nonetheless. Transport still look questionable at best. Bow tied down a long time ago. So far remaining in a downturn. All right, we are, I'm sorry I'm running so late tonight. We have time for just a couple of, yeah, sorry about that, Lauren. I'm, you're, you're here forever now. Hopefully I won't ever uh, delete the show or run out of shows. Uh, anybody want to talk about individual issues, any stocks you guys want to look at? 
weekly breakouts, that's peace, or making money lately. Um, weekly breakouts in S&Ps? Take a look at that. Yeah, and you know, that's the other thing too, is uh, maybe when the market gets choppy, don't forget about looking at the weekly charts, okay? So the weekly chart looks pretty darn good, okay? It, uh, momentum slowed in here. That's a little concerning, but for the most part, it looks pretty good. Yeah, CRBU, I actually had that in that sticky. I actually had that. Good job. CRBU, I don't know if you can read that or not. Um, but let's take a look at that. I did buy one IPO today. I've already forgotten what it is. I'll have to look. Yeah, this is a great example, and I'm glad you brought this one up. This is one that I want to bring up because this is this is a fantastic example, and I just ran out of time tonight. There's so much I needed to cover and want to cover, and I got three pages more notes that I want to cover too. But here's a case where the range was a little bit on the small side, okay? And then today it kind of makes the range and makes it worthwhile. If you took that one, I think that was, I think that's fine. Um, hang on a second, let me see which one I took. Talk amongst yourselves? Oh, come on. Oh my God. <laughs> I took CRBU. <laughs> that's the best looking stock that I've ever seen. This is what I would do. You you got kids, you got kids, just raid their college funds. You know, they're probably gonna study something that they can't make money in anyway, right? These kids nowadays has been going to all this debt on a <laughs> non-binary sexual dance theory degree or whatever. Um, I'm half kidding. If that's if your kids study non-binary sexual dance theory, then then good for them. Uh, but you know, just in case they might be going in that career, you're not so sure. Take all the money out of the college fund and put it in a stock. And if you have grandkids, take all your grandkids' money and put it in a stock. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, but this is one of those cases where this was a close your eyes and buy situation. Because it's hard buying it to set, especially me, because I'm Mr. Pullback, you know. I'm Mr. Pullback. He's Mr. Breakout. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's hard buying a market that's up so much, right? Especially percentage-wise. But sometimes that's the thing to do. And 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 okay, future self. Okay, how's future self gonna feel? Well, if this if this thing implodes, future self is gonna drop an F bomb. Okay, but future self is gonna look at it and say, you know what? I think it was worth a chance. I'm going to go out and find me a new stock today, right? Now, if I don't take this trade and it goes up 10 points tomorrow and I'm doing my scans all of a sudden, bam, this one's up 10 points. Future Dave is going to be really, really, really mad, okay? So that's probably why I took this trade. But it was one of those ones where I'm like, I knew I was on the fence with it. Uh, VTEX or one of those other ones I showed earlier was another one. But yeah, Jeff, that looks good. I, I was joking, by the way, about putting all your money into it, right? Sometimes, I think sometimes I do better when I buy shares that have beat the first day high. Well, in this case, it had, by the rules, if you're following the rules of the pattern, it has to buy, it has to take out the first day high, okay? Because in this case, day two, day three, day four, day five, none of those days traded above the day one high until today, okay? Okay, any more? I'm sure, we could pick them all up in Facebook, guys. And I know, I know I've been, I haven't been there much lately just because everything's so crazy. And I, I, it's like I've been spending most of my time that I spend in Facebook has been on the weekends catching up. But I, I promise I'll, I'll definitely check in a couple times tomorrow if there's any individual issues you guys want to discuss there. So I appreciate that. All right, I'm out of time. I had a blast tonight. Thank you guys for attending. I, I, I'm humbled by your presence. Thank you so much. Everybody have a fantastic night.
to those of you watching on YouTube, have a great weekend. If you like the video, like the video. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. Actually, actually, I learned today that not liking it helps the video. So if you don't like it, then eh, you, can, you can not like it. That's fine with me. <laughs> David says, great stuff. Another David says, good session. Thank you, David. And David, everybody have a great night again. We'll talk again tomorrow in Facebook, and then I'll see the rest of you guys and girls hopefully next week. Thank you so much.